Thank you so much, guys. So the cross as an offense is a very strange term. It is almost an oxymoron. It's almost like a collision of a concept. Because I know, you know, our world loves crosses. And when, when you drive past churches, all kinds of churches, the cross is very prominent in churches. The cross is also prominent in little lapel stud buttons people wear on their coats and on their jackets and on dresses. And maybe you've got a little charm bracelet of the cross on your Tiffany's little charm thing. And you, you like the cross there because you know people love the cross so much that thousands if not millions of people have had the cross tattooed in it's interesting places. The, the world really loves the cross, but you know, the world really loves the cross as a means to two things. Bring me luck and keep evil away. You lie in your home, it's a new home, and in the middle of the night you hear noises in the basement. And you go like, where's the cross? Go get that darn cross and open and I think, Psalm 23, Psalm 23, because in some movie it worked, because so somehow the cross mm, chases evil, and Psalm 23 tells you you'll survive the race. Amen. God bless you. Drop the mic. Let's go home. But Jesus says that's not what the cross is. The cross is not a rabbit's foot. The cross is not a lucky charm. The cross, let me just unlock this to you, is the worst kind of death that any human being would ever, ever encounter. The cross is brutal. The cross is not a place where it puts you on to teach you a lesson. No, lessons are not learned on the cross. You will encounter pain, suffering, and death. The cross speaks of three things every single time. The cross speaks of suffering. It speaks of death. And these things are inseparable. And the Bible says that the cross of Jesus is an offense. Paul says, people are angry at me. They criticize me. And I know if I stop preaching the cross of Jesus, the anger will stop because the cross of Jesus is an offense. You go like, what do you mean it's an offense? I want to say this to you, that if Paul had problems, we have much worse. Because you see, the cross of Jesus right now defies and confronts in our culture the philosophy around inclusiveness of anything and everything. In our culture right now, you can't say the wrong thing because people will jump on you, not if you say truth. But if it hurts people, keep your truth to yourself. The cross is an offense. Because, I don't know if you know this, but one of the most prevalent practices among young adults, millennials, is this thing called syncretism. Syncretism in a figure of speech is literally going to the spice rack of religions. And you've got a bowl called, this is how I do religion. And you take a little bit of Jesus out oh, there and take a bit of Buddha oh, oh there. A little bit of enlightenment I'll sprinkle. A little full agnostics I believe. You begin to take, pick and choose whatever you like of everything else. And you call it Christianity. Christianity has been trademarked already and God holds the pattern. You know what Christianity says? There is one way between man and God and that's Jesus. Jesus stood up in a culture of dualism where people worship numerous things idol worship was rife in the culture and Jesus stands up and he says I am the way the truth and the life and no one can come to the father except by me 
That is offensive. But the cross of Jesus is an offense. Not only did Jesus declare himself to be the only way before the Father, he also says that salvation is exclusive to one thing. The cross, the death, and the resurrection of the Son of God. Because he says in Acts chapter 4 verse 12. There is no salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven. Given among men by which we be saved. Oh. People go like. Well I'm sure there is another way. Well you can walk that way. I'm sure wherever Jesus says. He's going you ain't going there because he says, I'm the gate to the Father. You see, somehow we have become timid in our belief because we care about people's opinion more than what we care about God's opinion of truth and scripture. Somehow we, we don't want to hurt people's feelings. Let me tell you what Jesus says in Matthew 10 verse 34. Come on, tell your neighbor, say it's going to get rough a little bit just for a while. We're going to hit high tide. And, and, and I, I'm here to tell you fearlessly I will proclaim the words of Jesus. He says, Matthew 10 34. Come on, read it out loud. Come on, Greece campers. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against a mother, and a daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And I go like, what kind of Jesus say this? It's the Jesus who died for your sin. It's the Jesus that was resurrected out of the grave. You know what Jesus is saying? He says to be a disciple of him comes at a high price because the world wants to sniff out the disciples. It wants to make them powerless, wants to make them another dwindling voice because all other religions has room for everyone else. But Jesus says there's no other room for anything else. I am. And at that moment, we get really uncomfortable. But when I read in Scripture, in Hebrews 11.35, it begins to tell us of the kind of price people paid to follow Jesus. Can I ask you the question? What price have you paid personally to follow Christ? What price have you paid? What price have I paid? Maybe my price is a little higher because I speak publicly to thousands of people and I know that when you get in your car, you've got lots to say. God is watching you. God is watching you. God is watching you from a distance. Watch out, baby. That's okay to have an opinion. It's okay to disagree. It's okay. But disagreeing doesn't make you right. Listen, Hebrews 11.35, I'm reading in the message. It is the chapter where he talks about those people with great faith. People that we should admire. He talks about men and women that shut the mouths of lions. Women that got um, dead raised. And he talks about Abraham and he talks about Gideon. He talks about incredible people. Then he talks about there were some of those who followed him, who were tortured. They refused to give in and go free because they preferred something better. They preferred resurrection after death. Others braved abuse and whips and yes, chains and dungeons. We have stories of those who were stoned, sword in two, murdered in cold blood, homeless, friendless, powerless. Well, when we hear those things, it makes us uncomfortable because we're living in a country. To be honest with you, I, I read what Spurgeon says. He says in the beginning of time, people had to face the roar of a lion. Now they are being hugged to death by a bear. Because there is no high price to follow Jesus. But then Jesus continues to speak in Matthew 10, 38. 
Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, it's depressing right, right now, but it's going to get better right now. It's as low as it's going to go because Jesus says these words. Matthew chapter 10, 38. Come on, Greece campus. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy. Wait, wait. He's not talking about wearing a cross. He's not talking about tattooing a cross. He's not talking about, he's talking about the sacrifice of a cross. The weight of a cross. The, the, the burden of a cross. The, the, the self-death of a cross. Because he says this in verse 39. He who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Oh, beautiful people of God. The worst thing that I can do is to be what Scripture says in the last days. There will be those who tickle the ears of the listeners telling them what they want to hear. But, but you see, what you and I need to understand, that we're all going to stand before a living God one day. And I would rather be agitation to your moment, like Jesus was agitation to me on my knees as I was preparing. Agitation to a truth that following Christ means picking up your cross as a sign of laying down your life so that you can be fully alive in Him. Following Jesus is a decision that we make every day, because only when we do we begin to see the life of Christ comes from us because I want to make the statement to you that I believe there are too many people that honor God with their lips but they sit with frozen hearts hearts have grown cold because every single time we counsel marriages that are in trouble they always go to the things that irritates them about each other it is never that it is always the heart that has lost love. Jeremiah chapter 12 verse 2. God is speaking to the prophet Jeremiah. And he says this about the people. Come on, read with me. He says, you have planted them. They have also taken root. They grow. They have even produced fruit. You are near to their lips but far from their hearts. I don't know about you, but when I read that, I get real nervous. And I feel like the prophet, God, are you talking to me? Because I'm planted. I have roots. I, I stand and produce fruit. And so do you when we come together. I just watched you. You worship God with your mouth. But God says, all these things can be at the surface. But I test your heart. I, I weigh your intentions. I seek your first love. Because if I get all of this, but I cannot have your heart, I actually have none of it all. Because God says, I do not seek your words. I seek your heart. He says of the end time church, he says, you have lack of nothing. You have everything you need. And you do great things in my name. But this one thing I have against you, you have lost your first love. First love is what keeps marriages alive. First love is what takes you to a 60-year marriage celebration. Can I tell you about first love when you love Jesus? First love is when people gossip about you. Of your faith, you don't care because you love Jesus more. First love is when you're in the fiery furnace of, 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 of being tested. You don't point your finger to God because you know that He's refining your faith. And your faith is worth more than silver and gold. It doesn't matter whether you like. It doesn't matter whether you applaud it. It doesn't matter when you succeed or not. What matters most that when I lay my head on the pillow at night, I am a follower of Jesus that carried my cross today and lived from a place of love for God. I'm not going to calm down. Not today. You search me, God. Can I step a little closer? Just a little. Please say yes. Please say yes. Please say yes. yes, yes. I've got nine believers in the front. <laughs> you guys in the retractable seating, can I come closer to you just for a little bit? Thank you for the nine out there. Grace Campus, I want to come close as I can to you. 
Because you see, we, we talk about this beautiful thing called the church. We say God has a mission. That's where there's a church. You know the church is not just the gathering where you listen to me and we worship together and go home. You know that God has a desire to change the world. You know that. God, God aches when he sees the brokenness of the world. That's why he found you. He ached. When you were lost and he found you. He, he sent his son when you were yet a sinner. When I was yet a sinner. He knew us by name. The fact that you are sitting here today is not your smart idea. Because scripture says no one can come to the father unless drawn by the Holy Spirit. You think your girlfriend invited you. Uh uh Jack. God has been calling you. He's been yearning for you with his life. But now he doesn't want you just to sit here and, and just fill out church attendance. And go like, oh, church, I go like twice and that should be enough. And Christmas and baptisms, and that's how the way I rock. No, 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 no. You see, this is what God wants. He wants church families everywhere um, that He has planted people to become the people that are renowned and effective for His glory and His honor. He wants to take ordinary lives of people that have sometimes just really boring jobs, but your job is not who you are and what you're called to do. God wants to make your life glistening. He says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be, be hidden. You, you bring out the God colors of the world. You bring healing. You can change the tide. That's why he's given you leadership and influence. He's given you finance. He's given you expertise. God says, you are not a little person at all. Listen, you can choose to live a little life. But you're not called for a little life. It irritates me so bad. If we see two paths before us. One of sacrifice that leads to greatness and fulfillment. With a crown of glory as a reward. Or accumulating things and having the most at your estate sale while you die. Because you know that's the two that lies before us. And scares, the scary thing is that many of us are on this path right now. You feel good. You know, like a guy in the Bible, I'm going to get a little closer. That folded his hands and he looked and he says, my soul, you have done well to yourself. You don't even have storage for all the things you've accumulated. You need to go to you hall and get you some storage, some more. And the Bible says that night, God says, you fool. I will demand of your life. Because you see, at the end of the day, I'm here to tell you and virtual hug you, whoever you are, guest or not a guest, if I could agitate you and get a crowbar to lift you and look you in the eyes, if I can get 30 minutes of coffee with every single person in this place, I'll be wired when we're done. But I need 30 minutes to look you in the eye and tell you by name, sweetheart, what's your name? LaJoy. If I look at the LaJoy and we have coffee and, and I can see she's a mocha girl uh, with some whipped cream at the top. And, and I look at you and I go like, LaJoy, you've got to understand that God knew you before you were born. You don't have an ordinary life that everything that you have been through, the hurt, the pain, the good and the bad, is all constructed into this beautiful symphony and harmony that God has assigned places that only you can walk. And when you walk there, you don't walk in your own strength because the light of heaven shines through you don't live an ordinary life don't give your life to any kind of secondhand nothing because the greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world therefore you've got to stand up straight you begin to say my life is going to live for the glory and the fame of heaven and one day when i stand before jesus i'm not going to stand and hope i get in i'm going to say god i have served god i have obeyed god i've listened to the to the word of christ god i have sacrificed god i've been hated God had been persecuted. God, just like the prophets of old. It's a sign when people hate and criticize you. God says that his glory is on you. So why should you back down when people say mean things about you? God says it's a sign. It is a sign that they see on you the danger of a kingdom advancing. That would be the best mocha that you ever had. You say, P.O. You've got such a beautiful way to make me feel, yeah. No, no, 
No, it's nothing to do with me. I have no power to do nothing to you. You've got to understand the Holy Spirit is igniting words to your heart so that you begin to feel the stir in your heart and realize what life gives you as it is, is never enough. It cannot satisfy. So here we sit. Here we sit, musicians, you guys can come. And we know the church and the people in the church can be extraordinary. Imagine all the people in Rochester that understand they are the life of heaven on earth. When we begin to live our lives for the sake of others, bringing the kingdom of heaven down to earth, the healing of heaven down to earth, the life of Jesus down to earth, all these things you understand, it comes from a place of giving and not taking. And in that place of giving, I've got to be honest with you, every single time, and we do this about twice a year, tw twice a year, uh, out of the 53 weeks, we do it about six weeks twice a year. I want you to understand this. We begin to talk about the gift of giving, the spirit of generosity, because it's through that spirit of generosity, all that heaven comes, the very first thing you hear about God and you, John chapter 3 verse 16 goes like, for God so loved the world that he, God is still a giving God, and if we are the conduits of a giving God, doesn't it make sense that we would have giving lives, but ever whenever we talk about giving I always say to my wife, it feels so pointless because there is no case that I can make that's strong enough to ever convince our survival instincts as humans and our stubborn human nature of a non-logical thing like giving. If I were to sit there with the joy of sitting and, and I heard me preach, I would too sit there and go like, oh really? Really? Because I would hear the voices that you hear. You do hear voices like me. Please tell me you do. You know the kind of voices when you pray, you get on your knees to pray, and after about 35 seconds, you hear this voice that says, you better get up. You've got arthritis. You know that. You've got to get up. You know when I hear the voices the loudest? In January when it's time to fast and pray. The voice that fights obedience. You know what Romans chapter 8 says? As long as you and I are alive, the stubbornness of our nature will fight the voice of heaven. Every single moment that you choose to obey, you will have to overcome a fight in your mind. Do you know that being faithful to your wife is not luck? It's a decision you make in the moment when you can be unfaithful. It's walking away or walking to. And in that moment, I go like, there's nothing I can say in a million years. I know that that will ever have you open your heart and give. Only God can change that. Only God can do that. But, but human nature is so predictable because God talks about liberal, generous, overflowing, more than expected all the time. He talks about a tenth of our income. He says the first ten percent, the tithe is mine, says God. And I love this. I love this. I've had people that don't even know where Mark is in the New Testament make a case that tithing is Old Testament and we know I have to do it. Well, thou shalt not kill this Old Testament too and how you're living with that one. Obey your parents as Old Testament to how you're living with that one. You know why it's tough for us? Because it's asking something us. That's not just agreement. That's actually a sacrifice. And that moment, I have heard the meanest things people say. Some say it loud. Some say it soft. Some say it in pure resistance. People say that all oh, the church wants is your money. All Pastor P. Diddy wants is your money. He doesn't care about you. He just wants your money. And I'm saying you're a liar, you're a liar, you're a liar. Because if that is the truth, then I should not be standing here at all. Because it's interesting. It's not you guys. Don't you never say it's not us. It's the Greece campus. Greece, <laughs> say to each other, it's not us. It's the Chile campus. Definitely not us. 
I've had people say the meanest things to me in the lobby. But then they come and sit on a chair, breathe in air-conditioned air. They sing the songs. They eat the communion. They drink the coffee. They get all the hugs they can. And they are fed for 10 years. But they want to never be part of giving towards what's changing lives. Now, I am not guilting you into nothing. I am saying it's the logic that we do not have a giving problem. We do not have an argument problem. We don't have a, a teaching problem. We don't have a theology problem. We have a heart problem. It's got nothing to do with nothing else. Even the world knows love gives. Love gives. Love gives. Love gives kids if you love me and I come to your home you're gonna go oh, Pastor Peter and his wife's coming to our house I love them so much I'm gonna go buy stuff I cannot afford because I want them to know how much I love them but when we give to God it's hard and I think it's a hard problem Greece campus it is a hard problem and I want to tell you one last story. One last. Can I tell you one last story? Just one last. One last story. In the book of Jeremiah chapter 13. God comes to Jeremiah the prophet. He says, I want you to go buy a waistband. And I want you to tie it around your waist. Now the waistband that he tied around his waist was the same material. It was a linen material that the priest tied around their waist. And God says to him, do not put it in the water. Now think about all of this. So the prophet ties this tight to his body. Now he walks around with his waistband and it's not getting wet. Then God said to him, now arise son of man and go bury this waistband at the Euphrates in the cleft of the rock. Euphrates was a river. There was a distance travel. But now this is what you've got to understand. The Euphrates was close to the city of Babylon. Babylon was the city known for its seduction and sin. You know what's even worse? That Israel would go into exile, become slaves in Babylon eventually. So the Bible says, he said, I obeyed and I took linen belt off and I buried it and I went home then God says to him after a couple of days he says after many days son of man go and dig up what you have what you've buried go dig up that waistband and I want you to read what happened in Jeremiah chapter 13 verse 7 then I went to the Euphrates and dug and I took the waistband from the place where it had hidden it and lo the waistband was ruined. It was totally worthless. I looked up in the concordance and the commentaries. What ruined it? They say the seeping of the water into the linen rotted it out. And I go like, oh, I get it, I get it. God wants us to be like that waistband clinging to him and you'll find that out in a second but no we we want to go on a journey and bury ourselves and seeping up to the seduction and sin of babylon and babylon soon becomes the place of our bondage and then god said to the prophet jeremiah 13 verse 10 Though this wicked people who refuse to listen to my words, who walk in the stubbornness of their hearts and have gone after other gods. In other words, they have placed their affection in other things to serve them and to bow down to them. Let them be just like this waistband, which is totally worthless. And then God began to say in verse 11, for as the waistband clings to the waist of a man, so I made the household of Israel and the household of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord, that they might be for me a people renowned for praise and for glory. But they didn't want to listen. And then in verse 15, he says, listen carefully. 
Don't stay stuck in your ways. It's God's message you are dealing with. God, I think this morning, no matter what's going through your heart and mind, if you can hear this, agreeing or not agreeing, comfortable or not comfortable, there is no other way. Because God wants you to cling to Him as a first love. A dependence on him as the God that is the source of everything. In the 1800s, early 1900s, there were these missionaries. They were called the brave souls of one-way missions. Now, you say, what does that even mean? History tells us that these missionaries would pack their belongings not in a suitcase but in a coffin. And when they would get on ships to go on mission to foreign countries, they would wave at their loved ones knowing that they will not see them again. It tells a story of a man named A.W. Moln. He says he was one of those missionaries and he set sails for the new Hebrides in South Pacific. Where he was going was notorious for the headhunters that killed every other missionary that was ever sent there. When they said to him, aren't you afraid of where you're going, that you're going to die? He answered this, I didn't fear for his life. He says, because I have already died with Christ. He lived for 35 years among them. And when he died, the tribe buried him in the center of the village and erected a plaque that says this, before he came, there was no light. After he left, there was no darkness. So what are they going to say about you and I when we die? By the way, if I go first, you're invited to the funeral, and I want you to cry really hard for a very long time. I'm just saying, just saying. But what are they going to say about me? What are they going to say about you? Because you are shaping that right now with your life. What do you want to be known for? I pray that the Holy Spirit would begin to erect in you a dream. A dream that feels the pining of God's Spirit calling the greatness out of you. The Spirit that doesn't want to leave you alone and let you live just a normal, forgettable life and existence, but a Spirit that calls you to pick up the cross and follow Jesus, even if it's an offense to everybody around you. Because I'm here to tell you, God's desire for you is to be a people that's renowned for His glory and for His praise. I'm going to ask that we close our eyes right now just for a moment. I need no more than three minutes of your time, so please, if you can stay three minutes longer, we can dim the house lights down. Greece Campus, I'm going to pass it now to pass the Chris and the musicians to create ministry time where you are sitting. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come close and near to every heart. You know each of us by name, God. You're the only one that can tap our shoulder and we cannot ignore it. You're the only one that can keep come so deep into our souls that we cannot and will not ignore. If you are sitting in this place today and you say, I want to live a life that is expansive, a life that's renowned for God's glory, for God's fame, and this morning you say, God, I need faith and courage and boldness that you would call me out of this place of timidity and uncertainty. God, that you would lead me to the place of giving my life for the sake of life. If that is the cry of your heart, I know this is not easy. I want to encourage you to stand where you are as a sign. God, I'm unashamed because that is my desire today. I want to live that kind of life. 
Oh, thank you for standing. Thank you. Thank you for your boldness. Thank you. Thank you. For everyone that's standing, I'm saying there is hope for our city. There is hope for our community. If that is the cry of your heart in this place. And if you're sitting, I don't want you to be guilty because it's between you and God. It's totally between you and God. If you're standing right now, would you put your hand just on your heart and saying, Lord Jesus, I surrender everything, my all. Take all of me, Jesus. Give me the courage to pick up the cross and follow hard after you. Jesus, let your plan, your purpose, and my life become loud. Give me a giving heart. Give me a giving spirit. That my reflex would be obedience. That my heart will love deep. And put you first. God I walk away from everything. That is holding me back. In old meaningless ways. I'm leaping forward. To embrace you. In a whole new way. Jesus. Hold me tight. Jesus. Free me from entanglements. Jesus, make alive your dream in me. And give me the courage to run at all cost after you. Thank you that you hear this prayer. Thank you that you answer this prayer, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to take your seats for one second. Just for one second. I'm going to look straight at that camera to get as close as I can to your heart. I pray with all my heart that what you just pray, you will take it as a promise and a commitment to God to a new way of leaning in, a new way of opening your life, your hands, your heart, and asking God to show you where He has appointed your life to serve for the greater cause of this world. And I am so thankful for you. Because when I look at our services and those who are saying aloud, yes, it is well with our world and our city if this is the cry of our heart. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Thank you so much for allowing me to come close to your heart.